I'm uh, Tim Brentke, um, still um, uh, working in a part-time research capacity at uh, the University of Winchester uh, and I'm very pleased today to be in conversation with my former King Alfred's College colleague uh, of many years ago, Professor Victor Merriman, uh, and Vic and I have been working together uh, on different projects uh, over uh, a large number of years. Um, but more recently, and the focus for today's conversation uh, concerns um, the work that's been going on where he is presently employed, HL University. Uh, and uh, during his time at Edge Hill, he has developed uh, a monograph uh, called Austerity and Public Role Drama, which went online yesterday and will appear in print next week. So, uh, uh, Victor's going to talk about some of the framing concepts arising uh, from uh, how that the book came about. Uh, and culminating in the manifesto for public action through drama, which is proposed at the end of, of that book. Uh, and along the way, we're also going to be alluding to one of the, uh, the actions, as it were, that has already been set up, which is uh, an organisation called One Hour Theatre Company, uh, with, with whom, for whom, uh, I've been working uh, over the last um, four years or so. So we'll come on to those specifics. But I think it would be useful, uh, initially anyway, if Victor gave us the, the conceptual framework, as it were, underpinning the monograph. Okay. Thanks very much, Tim, and hello, everybody. And thank you for spending the time with us now. Um, it's very nice to be at the University of Winchester um, and to see the many changes, um, for the better, which have been made to the campus uh, since I last worked here 25 years ago now. Uh, it's that long, yes it is. Um, and uh, I'm happy to say that um, the work that I did at Winchester, uh, not just with my colleagues in drama, but with other colleagues um, around the university, uh, is work uh, on which I look back very fondly and which continues to inform um, what I'm trying to do now. Um, the book is called um, Austerity and the Public Role of Drama, and the subtitle is Performing Lives in Common. Um, as Tim uh, mentioned, serendipitously, uh, Halbury Macmillan notified me yesterday that it's now online, and the print version is due on the 5th of March. Um, so the book really draws on research that I've done since since the imposition of austerity on this country in 2010. Um, so it's been a while in, in, in the making. And of course, the, when austerity um, was opted for as a political choice by the Cameron Clegg government, um, it delivered rapidly a series of shocks. And of course, most people were reeling from those shocks. Um, the shock to people like us um, was generally felt at you know, an intellectual, even a, a, a moral level, with some practical consequences. But for people who were exposed after three decades, really, of neoliberalisation of British society, which in Britain takes the specific form of an assault on, on the institutions of the welfare state, those shocks were particularly severe. Um, as late as the other day, um, Radio 4 uh, had an item on, I think, the Today programme, um, which addressed the crisis that working families find themselves in uh, upon the death of a child. In short, many people are unable to afford a funeral for a child. And the British state, through the local authorities, has now reinstitutionalized the pauper's burial. And these burials apparently take place at dead of night and the family are not even notified. So this is how far, I don't like the phrase we have come, because of course we, we have to hold up there, but it's, it's how far we've been brought. Um, so there is, if you like, to use once again an overworked phrase, we used to only use this 
word in relation to Samuel Beckett and Jean Paul Sartre years ago, but it's an existential crisis, really. It's a, a, a crisis of value. I got, in 2013, uh, my university supported me in um, organizing a colloquium on performance and domination to which Tim contributed, and the proceedings of which, well, the revised proceedings of which were uh, published as a special issue in the online journal Critica Cultura uh, in, in 2013 uh, also. Um, and we addressed the ways in which um, theatre and other performance forms were beginning to address domination. Um, it, it was almost like revisiting Paulo Freire's famous statement from his Pedagogy of the Oppressed that the dominant theme of our epoch, epoch is oppression. Um, so we, we convened uh, a number of people uh, from various parts of the world in a very, what I thought was a very productive session. I think the, the published papers uh, testify to that. Um, and out of that then, um, a research group which exists called Performance and Civic Futures developed. And the basic wager of Performance and Civic Futures was Parliament, Parliament and parliamentary democracy has more or less been captured by the moment of austerity, which has enabled neoliberalisation to be exacerbated, to go, as they're fond of saying, to the next level. Not that this was ever the declared prospectus of austerity, which was all about housekeeping and Mrs. Thatcher's um, rhetoric coming back again. So the question then was, well, what do you do? I mean, if you don't have a responsive political system, um, and Ivan Krasta pointed out in an article in the, um, in the New Statesman, you know, he was cited in the article, I think, you know, voters in, in, um, under neoliberalism can vote for anyone they like, and they can change the personnel, and they can change the government, but they cannot change the economic system. And as the economic system has evolved, and as the economic system is a choice, that has very severe consequences for democracy. Now, Wendy Brown, in her book, uh, Undoing the Demos, Neoliberalism's Stealth Revolution, writing from uh, her position in California, had a scathing critique, not just of the destruction of public life, uh, which is a major concern of the book, by the way, but also of the role of um, the academy in enabling that, or certainly not confronting it. And that has become part of my concern as I've, um, as I've worked through the research. So, in a sense, that, that was the foundational moment. And then I had, I had a number of opportunities to develop my ideas in relation, uh, first of all, to understanding uh, neoliberalism. There is a fashion among some of our colleagues for saying, oh, it's a useless word, it doesn't mean anything. People throw it around. Well, I don't throw it around. And neither do the political economists I've been reading. It's very, very real, as I think most people would agree. But what I found interesting uh, to do was to look at the genealogy of neoliberalism, neoliberalization as a process, which I've often thought of as very similar to colonization. It's a productive relationship. I haven't gone as far as I might have gone in teasing that out, but it's something for another day, perhaps. Um, but to look at liberalism itself and how we understand liberalism. We're told in recent years that we live in, in a liberal democracy. What does that actually mean? And what is an illiberal democracy of the kind favoured by Mr. Orban in Hungary and by President Trump? And I would argue by Theresa May. I don't see her as a Democrat in any meaningful sense. How can you cancel votes just because you're going to lose them? It's a serious question. Um, what can you say of a national parliament that has non-binding votes? How does that happen? And I think one of the things that the, the whole um, Brexit thing has exposed is just how shaky the foundations of Britain's liberal democracy actually are. And it's exposing this every bit as clearly as it's exposing the weakness
uniqueness of the idea, the very idea of unity at the heart of the appeal to the United Kingdom. Because the unity of the United Kingdom, if you ask people in Scotland or in Wales, could even ask people in Cornwall, let alone Northern Ireland, was not achieved by means of referendum. It was achieved by force of arms. And unities like that tend to come unstuck, given changing historical circumstances. So going back to look at the genealogy of liberalism, I drew on David Lloyd and Paul Thomas's book, Culture and the State, which is a conscious attempt to acknowledge Raymond Williams' wonderful work on culture and society, but also to ask a question about the power of the state in relation to culture. And the book was published by Routledge in 1998, and I think it remains a very interesting treatise on liberalism as well. And one of the, the things about growing up um, in the 1960s and 1970s was that liberalism was actually a nice word. And liberals were nice people. In fact, niceness was kind of, you know, the selling point, if I can use that language, of liberalism. But what we realised as the neoliberal movement um, signified in, in this country by the election of Margaret Thatcher in 1975 as leader of the Conservative Party, the neoliberal movement had gotten really tired of the post-war settlement. It wasn't generating the unbounded wealth that the elites had come to expect. The wealth was being shared over much. And workers um, were demanding, um, demanding a voice and demanding political power. Now, we can see the seeds of Thatcherism not just in Barry Goldwater's presidential campaign in the United States in 1964, um, not just in just, uh, Judge Lewis Powell's uh, 1971 memorandum, but we can also see it in the Wilson government and in Selina Todd's wonderful book, um, published in 2014, The People, The Rise and Fall of the Working Class, she quotes uh, Bernard Donoghue, who was an advisor to James Callaghan, um, in relation to Dennis Healy's response to the IMF intervention in the British economy in the late 60s. And um, Donoghue says, we began to institute processes for a, which basically would later become known as Thatcherism. So it's very interesting to take a slightly longer view. In um, Jean-Francois Lyotard's um, book, Postmodernism, A Report on Knowledge, um, he actually has a footnote about British higher education policy in the early 70s in relation to the, the control that the Wilson and Callaghan governments were beginning to exert over research in the academy. So it, you know, while I probably would yield to nobody in, in the things that I could say about Mrs. Thatcher in a pejorative way, it's important to realize that Thatcherism didn't come from nowhere. And Jeremy Gilbert's work on liberal Britain is particularly interesting in looking at the role of moralizing discourses and their intersection with economic discourses. And of course, that absolutely took off under austerity as well. Now I can talk all day, Tim, but if you want to ask me another question, well, Not in. so much asking the question as perhaps moving you on towards you. the ground of our, uh, back to the book. Yeah. Right. <laughs> precisely where. Right, precisely <laughs> yeah. where. Um, I suppose um, the core thing uh, as, uh, as the title provokes one to think about is um, the, where do the macro political issues around austerity that you've just been articulating, where do those intersect with um, a, a set of drama practices, certainly in the case of applied theatre, uh, at a moment when certainly many critics would see applied theatre as in danger of a, acute domestication. Mm. So are is applied theatre in essence uh, just a sort of touchy-feely arm of austerity? Or are there, are there uh, po possibilities of resistance? I think that's probably mm. Yeah, 
No, that's right. You that's almost a rhetorical question. I mean, the answer is uh, yes and yes, <laughs> I think. But well, just to say, um, and, and to conclude what I was saying, essentially the argument I've been outlining is, is the first section of the book, which is articulated over two chapters. And one of the things that I discovered going back over the history of liberalism was what I'm calling a liberal spectrum. So that we begin with liberalism, and we then move to neoliberalism, and now there is an emergent post-liberalism. You may remember Mrs. May's comment about people who were citizens of nowhere. Well, there's um, a, a very active individual called David Goodhart, who actually founded Prospect magazine, which to my surprise has been around since 1996. Um, and Goodhart is, is a post-liberal. And then you have uh, Milbank and Pabst, whose book, The Politics of Virtue, is um, a post-liberal treatise as well. And um, so I was looking at what they seem to be saying, well, what they are saying, is that they were going to go back to where David Lloyd um, and Paul Thomas said liberalism began, which was with a cultural project. Okay, it was always an economic project, but they talk about, you know, Wordsworth's poet and Coleridge's parson as ideal citizens. And they point to the ex uh, essentially pedagogical nature of the, liber uh, the liberal project. Milbank and Pabst are saying, well, we need to go back there. And one of the things that they suggest is that schools, um, there should be more military academies um, in order to impart what they call Greco-Roman and Judeo-Christian values to a presumably um, feckless uh, population. Um, so along the spectrum then, and in the context of post-liberalism, what you see is an acknowledgement of the fact that what I think with some justification can be called the social barbarity of neoliberalization, especially under austerity, that this has gone far enough and is now unsustainable. Um, and therefore, there must be an amelioration. But you'll be interested to know that Goodhart and Milbank and Pabst are dead set against what I refer to in the subtitle of my book as life in common or the common good. They don't like it. They would argue that you can have the common life of a community, for instance. And of course, what's, what's actually embedded in that notion is that the common life of a community includes hierarchies that they wish to protect. So it's not necessarily a democratic project either. So how does all this relate to, uh, to drama? Well, drama, it seems to me, is a public art form. That's one axiom, if you like, uh, in, in relation to, to my thinking in the book. So. If ideas of the public and the institutions that sustain them and our concept of a public man or woman, of public life, of public service, are all under strain, under threat, um, to the point that Wendy Brown talks about civilizational despair, well then, how does a public art form exist or respond to that reality? And that was the question that, that I began with. And so I looked at... Um, a number of case studies where a slightly more elaborated form of drama, which we can include now in the umbrella of performance, shows very explicitly how performance can intervene in an authoritarian society, which is really, I suppose, where we end up. If we're not a liberal democracy, then there are authoritarian trends. And if anyone doubts that, I think the Windrush scandal alone stands as, uh, as evidence that there is um, the hostile environment policy of successive governments is actually the playing out of an authoritarian worldview. So if you look, uh, as I do, um, at Dario Fo's work, a late play, which he rewrote after the election of Pope Francis. Um, and the play comes to me through the work of Mario Pirovano, who is a foremost interpreter of Faux. Um, and in Francis the Holy Jester, which is the title of the play, there is an episode called um, St. Francis's Harangue uh, in the city of Bologna in the year 1222. Uh, Francis was a historical figure, and there are extant records, but as Faux points out in the introduction to the published script, there was a great deal of intervention by subsequent authorities in the Franciscan order which repressed aspects of Francis's work 
and crucially of his performative personality. And he himself saw himself as a jester. And the scene that Froh dramatised um, was performed originally in, in front of 5,000 people in the square in Bologna um, at the height of a bloody conflict with the neighbouring city of Imola. And to give you a short precy, um, Francis goes in with what Fro would call the tricks of the trade. And he starts by saying, it's wonderful to be in Napoli. Neapolitans, how kind of you to invite me to your city. Of course, then he has to be uh, kind of nudged. You're not in, in Napoli, you're, you're in Bologna. And of course, he grabs the crowd's attention. And then he literally transforms himself physically and performs this extraordinary, uh, what appears at face value, to be an endorsement of Bologna's bloodthirsty campaign against Imola. And goes into a whole uh, trope around how, how pleased the women of Bologna must be to sacrifice their men to this noble cause. How delightful it is to be a maimed hero coming back with no hand. What a wonderful thing it must have been to go to Palestine on crusades and come back maimed or not at all. And of course, this provocation produces tears in the crowd. And he then stops and says, this is unthinkable. You reject patriotism. What are you doing? Oh, the next thing, you're going to go down to the nobles of the city and tell them to sue for peace. Where will this end? And historically, what happened three days later was that after Francis left, the people stayed in the square and they thrashed out a treaty with Imola. They went to the city hall and it's kept in the archives of Bologna to this day and they forced the city worthies to conclude a peace. Now my argument is that of course Francis didn't write the treaty but what he did do through his performance was to open up a space and crucially in the context of that particular chapter, it's a performance of folly. Which brings me nicely to Reverend Billy. Reverend Billy Taylor, who is an American performance artist and activist. Um, he and his partner, Savitri D, once a week now, um, go to a garden, um, which is, I think, on the sixth floor of Trump Tower in Lower Manhattan. And they're allowed in because in order to get planning permission, uh, the city authorities demanded that there be a publicly accessible space. So Reverend Billy and Savitri go in um, once a week and they write in the garden at the heart of Trump Tower. They go over the golden lift and all that sort of stuff. I met him first in Liverpool and there is a wonderful short video online of Reverend Billy in Tesco in Bull Street in Liverpool performing an exorcism on the cash registers. And um, he, he is the, the pastor of the church of Stop Shopping. And there are some online interviews on Sky News and Fox News where <laughs> the interviewers simply cannot at any level understand what the activism is for. And they do things like they pick at Black Friday and, and all this sort of stuff. But Reverend Billy is a very serious thinker and activist, and his, his, his main concern now is the fate of the planet, and so he has become an environmental activist. Um, they have gone and done actions against Monsanto um, and British Petroleum in the Tate Modern in London, um, where they brought in balloons full of oil and drenched themselves in the oil. Uh, to protest the sponsorship of Tate Modern by VP. So it's very much light art tradition, very performative. It was a, a really interesting uh, account of how he became a preacher um, in his, uh, his memoir. He was running a theatre in New York, kind of a theatre manager, and sleeping in the building, he had a little room there. And uh, he went up to 42nd Street to the Disney store, and he went in and started preaching that Mickey Mouse was the Antichrist. You can imagine how this went down. He's also banned from every Starbucks in the world. Uh, and they have a corporate memo entitled, What to do if Reverend Billy comes into your store. Um, so the, here you see somebody using performance and the larger than life. I mean, his own criticism 
of the moment when he was outside the Disney store preaching that Mickey Mouse was the Antichrist. And um, a middle-aged woman came over to him and said, what are you doing, son? And he said, and he tried to explain the, the anti-corporate shtick that he was working through. And she said, but I've just been in there buying toys for my grandchildren. They love them. And it was a, a wonderful moment where he said, there is a contradiction here, and I haven't explored it yet. And then he went to study, and he, he looks like Billy Graham, actually, and that's the kind of preacher persona that he uses, wears a white suit, and the, the reverend, uh, the collar, and so on, and the lacquered hair. Uh, very well worth uh, making acquaintance with if you don't know his work. So, when I, went to, when I looked at that, which was very much performative, I also looked at the work of Jim Nolan, the Irish playwright. So Jim Nolan's interesting because in Britain you have a thing called the State of the Nation play. No one in Ireland writes State of the Nation plays, for I think historical reasons. Um, some would say there is no nation, some would say it's a partial nation. Um, the Brexit has once again opened up um, a set of conversations which no um, harm having them, but the context is, is more problematic. But um, Jim Nolan does write public plays, and he wrote a play called The Guernica Hotel, which was about survivors of the Spanish Civil War and their annual meeting and its disruption by emergent neoliberal economic forces, but embedded in the family. It's a father with sons, and it's a kind of family drama. Um, but the play I was interested in uh, came after his play Dreamland from 2014, and it's called uh, Johnny and I Are the New Year, and it's about commemorating the rebellion of uh, 1916 in 2016 in the context of a small local newspaper being taken over, a corporate takeover by a media conglomerate with offices, we are told, um, from uh, well, extending to the Antipodes. Um, I found that play a very interesting play because what no one was doing was declaring that drama was a deliberative space, which in Ireland it has always been. Um, but actually restoring that um, as something in a, in, in a regional theatre, regional art centre, which the National Theatre appears to be quite queasy about at the moment because of the, co the corporatization of the governance structures and also the, the involvement in festival culture and so on, which come with neoliberalism. You know, um, so then, what I, what I decided to do then was to look at, you know, I looked at some of the limitations of drama as well, and I thought, well, we've had enough of that, let's see what we can actually do. So I looked at one of our theatre company, which is the company uh, with Tim and David Pima uh, that we, we, we founded, and what we did was we had a project which responds to some of the problems perceived with, with applied theatre, because we, we argued, well, there's a lot of good stuff in applied theatre, but it's only the people who are suffering who see it. They create it and they show it more or less to each other. Where are the influential people? And I don't necessarily mean, you know, the captains of industry and so on, but I do mean people who have, you know, good jobs, uh, solid incomes, whose children are likely to go to higher education, and who probably bump into local councillors and MPs at social occasions. What are those people? Why are they not being confronted with what um, Kevin Curran calls ethical encounters? So we turned to Shakespeare, cultural capital, ladies and gentlemen. And we thought people would go to Shakespeare, even if what they get, in the words of Bernard Shaw, is not quite what they bargained for. So Tim uh, did a version of, of Measure for Measure called Half Measures. And there are two dramatic worlds. One is the plot line in which uh, Lord Angelo seduces um, the young nun Isabella, which is set in, in uh, Vienna in the 17th century. And then alongside that, we had the story of the encounter between Nadia, who's an economic refugee from eastern Ukraine, and Angelo Saldini, who is a fictional footballer at Liverpool Football Club. Um, we have received no writs from the club yet, which may mean they haven't seen the play. Um, anyway. Uh, so what happens is in the play that we see a parallel between what is asked of Isabella, which is basically to submit to what she says in the original um, Angelo's concupiscible, uh, concupiscible lust. Mm. And then, um, right. and Sardini makes the same work with, with Nadia. In the second play, David Pima and Robert Gordon's play, um, which is A Pound of Flesh, we meet Caravan and Shylock together. 
And so we have two worlds, uh, more or less conjoining in that play. In the third play, to which we were able to give two public readings, we, or rehearsal readings, we didn't have the funds for a full production, and it seemed to be an urgent play to do. We did one in Croxted in Liverpool at the Community University, and later that night at the Blackie Community Arts Centre at the centre of Liverpool. That was Lear in Brexit Land. It was another of Tim's plays, but this time Lear inhabits, um, he's in hospital, he comes in at the beginning uh, to an A&E unit in an NHS hospital, wheeled in by his fool. And he meets Lee Smith, who's a young lad who's just been injured on a poorly regulated buildings uh, site. And of course, to Lee's horror, because he's voted for Brexit, and he discovers that his nurse is um, a, a Ugandan Haitian of Gujarati extraction, who was born in Britain. And, uh, and his consultant doctor is of Polish origin, also born in Britain. And so, through the use of monologue, which is a feature of his plays, um, we get an opportunity, and this is where the ethical encounter bit comes in, I think. My question was, how often do the people of Ormskirk and Lancashire, which is where my university is situated, um, get to spend time with a young woman from the Ukraine and hear her story from her point of view? The answer is never. But they did get it if they went to health measures. How often do they get time to sit with Shylock and Caliban, the Jew, and the person of African ex extraction, and actually consider the racial framing of these characters from canonical dramas. How often do they get an opportunity to hear a young white man articulate his pain, because he's in agony, by the way, throughout the play, and also his sense of racial entitlement simply drifting away. And how often do they get to understand the Britishness of a young woman whose granddad came from Uganda expelled by Idi Amin, and the Britishness of another young woman whose grandfather fought in the Battle of Britain as a Polish airman? And the answer is probably never. When our theatre company uh, guarantees that no play will be longer than an hour, and then the second part of the evening is a discussion, and a great deal of time in the book is taken up talking about the problematics of that. And we draw on the work of our friend and colleague, uh, Brendan Burns, who used to run Soul and People's Theatre. He did, indeed, yes. And he's now installed at Liverpool Institute of Performing Arts, where he runs an exceptional community drama course. Absolutely extraordinary. And Brendan kindly gave me unpublished work he'd done on facilitation. Um, and he has generated five uh, principles for dialogue, six of them. Um, so the question is, and who asks them? The need to depersonalise issues. His, his real concern was dealing with um, xenophobia after Brexit. And these are the principles. Personalise people but depersonalise issues. Define issues and use questions to build logos rather than emotional responses. Keep the discussion future facing. Use reframing to manage registers of discourse and make appropriate use of euphemisms. They're very much practical suggestions in relation to how you reconcile very, um, very strongly held opposing views in a room. I also drew on Hilary Wainwright's book, Towards a New Politics from the Left, and her five lessons from the case studies that she looks at, one of which being the Lucas Plan, find common ground, build democracy, build alliances and look ahead, build collective strategic intelligence and know the limits. And into the mix also came civic forums, eight rules of dialogue. The, the Velvet Revolution in Prague started in a theatre. It was started by performing arts students. Václav Havel, who led it and later became president of the Czech Republic, was a playwright. And there are eight rules of dialogue. I won't give you them all, but they do say, they, they map on very closely to Wainwright and to Burns. And the first point is when searching for truth together, opponents are not enemies. And that seems to me to be a really important point. So that fed into my understanding then, which was expressed in a manifesto, and to um, people considering authorship here, be very careful when you promise your editor a manifesto. Because it's very difficult to write, but actually a really rewarding project as well, and, and quite a discipline. And my manifesto identifies a series of problems that have come up through the text, um, through the research, and then tries to respond to them with principles, and then asks, well, what does that look like in action? What are the consequences for how it relates to democratic culture? And what are its implications for performance? I'll give you just one example, if Tim will allow. Um, 
Right. Here's the problem. Theatre institutions and conventions have been captured by neoliberal logic. They've all the marketing departments now, and they're interested in, you know, um, uh, safe programming, which will generate what they want, which is box office. And okay, that's always been part of theatre. No one's denying that, but it is exacerbated now. So what's the principle to apply to it? Well, if we focus on drama as a public art form and a social process, we realise there's something missing from the marketization of the, what's called the creative industries. So what action can we take? Well, I argue that we should negotiate space and support within universities for critical performance projects. And if you look alongside that, I've, you know, my choice of critical performance studies from my own chair at Edge Hill is deliberate and it was informed by working with people working in critical race studies. Um, there's also critical legal studies, critical ge geographical studies and so on. These are wonderful movements. Critical sociology is another one. Wolfgang Street spoke How Will Capitalism End is particularly good on this. He argues that sociologists um, actually abdicated responsibility for political economy and so were asleep at the wheel when neoliberalism turned up. They couldn't deal with it. Do you, do you see these forms as deriving from critical pedagogy as articulated by Fleury and McLaren? They're absolutely. Uh, yes, particularly McLaren and Giroux. Mm -hmm. they're, they're absolutely cognate mm -hmm. with those. Uh, they are egalitarian, they're libertarian projects. Yeah. And they're critical projects which also realise that, as I say in the final um, section of the manifesto, we can't do this on our own. We have to work together. We have to, and I've made a huge, um, I have a huge debt to media studies here as well. And um, to a recent book by my colleague at Edge Hill, Paddy Hoey, Shinner's Dissos and Dissenters, where he looks at the use of new media by um, the Republican um, mainstream and Republican dissidents in Northern Ireland around the time and since of the Good Friday Agreement. So what, how does that type of thing relate to democratic culture? Well, I argue that it enables universities to perform a public role as sites of critical deliberation. And deliberation is crucial. That's why a sense of the public is so important. Because a parliament which is fully informed by a sense, um, its liberal inheritance, if you like, as a public institution, is a site of deliberation. Not simply a, a meeting of cabal of self-serving entrepreneurs, which I think is what's going on in Westminster at the moment, to all our disadvantage. And the final point, what does it do for performance? Well, it takes drama beyond those with what Alan Reid calls theatre in common. And this has implications for repertoire, for casting and event design. And we need, I think, in all of those things to foreground ethical questions around the other. How do we meet the other? How do we imagine the other? And that's a crucial question because as Brendan Byrne shows, in the cities and in the places in this country where multiculturalism is a lived fact of everyday life, people voted to remain in the European Union. In the places where multiculturalism is not a fact but a terrifying possibility conjured in the uh, metaphorical universe of the tabloid press, for instance, and of course recycled, by respectable mainstream media, people voted to leave. And a final point um, in relation to drama, which is um, readily available to all of you, the Guardian Brexit shorts. Um, one of the places called Time to Leave by David Hare, and it's set up the road in a garden in Winchester. Um, and these are very fine dramas, which are real meditations on aspects of Brexit. There are nine of them. One in Belfast along the Peace Line, there's one in, in Glasgow, there's a, a memorable one in Birmingham called Just a T-Shirt um, by, I think it's Mira Sayal, and it's about a woman of Sikh origin uh, who voted to leave because bad immigrants were giving good immigrants a bad name and a racist incident that happens afterwards. Well, they're very profound, uh, and Hadi Hoey's good on this. Um, the mediation of protest. When our students were kettled on London Bridge in 2009 to 2010, those students used their phones to record what was going on and circulate images through social media, which countered the images being uh, pumped out by BBC News, notably in Ben Brown's disgraceful interview with Jodie McIntyre 
uh, when he asked this man in a wheelchair, uh, who was dragged from the wheelchair by three or four police officers, yes, but did you drive your wheelchair in the direction of the police? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If it wasn't so serious, it would be really funny. So what I argue that eventually is that we need to, to move to author mediation, where we always have the live event, we stick to that, but we do actually record it, and thank you for today. Um, we do record it, and then we circulate it, either in totality or in you know trailer-sized um, bites, as it were. The Beatrice Webb Foundation and the um, campaign uh, or the Centre for Local Economic Studies in Manchester and places like that. Yeah. We probably wouldn't sit down in the morning and think we need a play about this, but if they saw a certain kind of play and the discussion provoked, we'd probably be very happy to circulate it among the people they're trying to reach.